This podcast is brought to you by sarahraven.com, which is home to everything you need for a truly beautiful and productive garden. You'll also find great and essential gardening kit and stylish, lovely things to have in your house to bring the outside indoors, all inspired by the garden and the house being tied together. There's also plenty of garden inspiration, how-to videos and specialist growing guides. So head over to sarahraven.com today to discover even more. Welcome to Grow, Cook, Eat, Arrange, the podcast of today, just me on my own, because I thought at this time of year, it would be a really nice thing to continue the 12 best series. And I thought this week I would do the 12 best edible flowers because I've really noticed recently uh, that there's a kind of big increase in interest in edible flowers. And I think that probably goes with gardening and with food, but um, I get asked more about edible flowers now than I was five years ago, 10 years ago, whatever. So I thought it might be really nice to do a sort of recap, a kind of general overview of edible flowers that you can really easily grow. And what I love about this group of plants is that you genuinely don't need a big garden. You can really, really just have a few pots on a window ledge, on a sunny balcony, or on a doorstep. Or of course, you know, if you have more space in a garden, you can have more. And I thought to start with, I'd just talk about the ways that you can use edible flowers. And then I'm gonna move on to a month by month calendar of my 12 favorites to take us right the way through from January to December. But before we do that, it's really how you use them. So here in the Garden and Cookery School, over in the building next to where I'm sitting here recording, we use edible flowers every single day of the year. And I never, ever walk into the kitchen if we've got an event or a course or anything and there isn't laid out on some damp like tea towel or some damp kitchen roll or whatever, a really lovely medley of different flowers. And they are used here for just normally just either scattering over a salad, which is the commonest way we use them. So we always try and make a salad with a mix of maybe six or eight different leaves with different flavors. And then the final ingredient would be a scattering of petals. And I'll come on to which in a bit, which are the best for that. But also we use them for scattering over puddings. And it just, it looks, I don't know, I remember a famous chef saying to me it was too wine bar for him and I know what he means, but but actually I I rather love them on the plate. <laughs> so yes, just um, on the edge of a plate or again, just petals scattered over the pudding itself looks incredibly nice. So the first role, I guess, with, with them is scattering. The next role, which we really, really love here is tempura-ing them. And we wouldn't probably just do edible flowers. We do a mix of different things according to which week in which month in which part of the year. And so we just had a really lovely event here where we did garden tempura and we use courgette flowers and we use bean runner bean flowers and we use sage flowers as well as sage leaves and um, and we actually tempered the whole sort of top section of borage because the leaves of borage are edible as well as the flowers. And it, you get these great shapes in the crunchy batter. And I'm going to put the recipe in the podcast notes, um, which you can download them from the website, as with always. But so our recipe here that we use, which gives you that really lovely, airy, crunchy, sort of classic Japanese tempura batter is 150 grams of plain flour and 100 grams, so not quite as much, of corn flour and then 10 grams of baking powder. And you basically sift those into the bottom of the bowl, make a well, just like with any batter, pour in 
cold, sparkling water. And I, I sort of think it's, it's sort of to double cream consistency. But another way of measuring it is if you put your clean finger into the batter and take it out, it's enough to make it coat your finger. And then salt and pepper to taste, but you, you really need quite a lot of that for extra flavor. And that gives you just, um, if it's cold and it then hits the hot oil, it literally balloons and just gives you that delicious, delicious airiness, which you, you just don't want a sort of soggy coating because uh, that's just not very nice. You want a thin coating, but you want it to be all bubbly and airy and balloony. And so tempura is just my favorite, favorite thing. And you never want to do that for lots of people. Our chef here, Sophie, just had a most awful day the other day when she had to do it for 35 or even 40. And that is just a killer. You just want to do it for, I don't know, two, four, six, because otherwise you're, you're just sweating over <laughs> hot oil uh, for too long. So yeah, keep, keep the um, numbers limited. And then another way, so the sort of third way that we use them here is for actual flavor. And so, for instance, I love using nasturtium flowers in a haddock, smoked haddock fish cake because nasturtiums are really peppery and you can actually pickle them like the bard and, and the seed pod, just like a caper. But they give you a really peppery flavor, the leaf and the flower and the bud. And so if you fold them into a mashed potato in a fish cake, if you want a really light fish cake, you might want salmon. If you want a slightly sort of more robust flavored fish cake, you might want a smoked haddock. But anyway, whatever fish cake you're making. And then you pick a good couple of handfuls of nasturtium flowers, always checking for that, that nasty beetles and cabbage white caterpillar eggs and even larvae, I mean the caterpillars, and, and then you fold it in. And then I, so I would then do the classic thing with a crunchy fish cake. I would first of all put them into flour. Then I would put them into egg, whipped lightly um, forked through egg. And then I put them into a breadcrumb and then I would fry them. But the lovely thing is with the nasturtium, when you cut into the fish cake, you get these bright, vivid orange coloring of the nasturtium flour and it gives you the flavor. So that's another one. And I love using runner bean flowers, like in a pilaf, just added at the end or, or just scattered over a rice salad or whatever. And again, they taste deliciously beany. And so that's where you're using the actual flavor of the flour, which a lot of them don't really taste of anything, but particularly the herb and salad leaf flowers like rocket taste very rockety. A bean, but particularly runner beans are so prolific. You don't mind miss, you don't mind picking the flowers because you actually get too many runner beans and nasturtiums too. So, so that's the third role is using their actual flavour. The final two are things that we might do to really push the boat out, but they're a bit more fiddly. And I'm not a fiddly sort of cook. I like I kind of quite wham bam. Um, so the next one would be using the edible flowers for frosting. I mean, or you frost them and you dip them in egg white that's whipped and then you dip them in sugar and it just preserves them literally by frosting them. And I find easier than that is ice bowls. So if I'm having a party and I'm going to serve ice cream, I might make an ice bowl before, which of course stops the the ice cream melting so quickly. And what I find with that is it's best to get a really thin base of ice by putting a slightly smaller bowl inside a slightly bigger bowl, but only very slightly. And so you, then you get a film of water and then I'll put a layer of rose petals or edible flowers onto that ice bowl. And then I will put a little bit more water in and then put the bowl back in again. And then I might want to do another layer. So I'll, I'll freeze that for an hour or two. And then if I want another layer of putting perhaps some edible leaves in it, like some nasturtium, sorry, not nasturtium, pelagonium leaves, you know, so you're gradually layering up these different layers of iced flowers. And that's a, a really lovely thing. And then the final one, which again is, is something that we don't do all the time, 
is you can literally whiz up sugar and the flowers of something that you're going to that sort of fits with a sweet flavor and my assistant here who does all our baking called Anita Rogues just talked to me about this just yesterday she's been experimenting with making rose sugar and so she just puts in the food processor lots of pink rose petals and sugar and she just processes them together so you get this intense flavored rosy pink sugar which you can then just scatter over a lovely Victoria sponge for instance which is what she's doing and you get this beautiful color and the beautiful essence of the rose through it and of course you could do that with lemon zest and you know all the traditional ways you can do that with lavender you could do it with rosemary but roses at this time of year in in summer are particularly lovely so those are the sort of roles that we use them but as I say the easiest quickest and every day for us here is just scattering them over a salad so then the next thing I just wanted to move on to is to take us through the year with my favorite edible flower for that month and just talk a little bit about it and how you grow it and the first is the family of primrose and polyanthus. So, of course, primroses in the lanes tend to, you know, the classic pale yellow primrose, tend to flower from February. But actually what I find is that in a sunny spot, they actually can flower from January. And there are certain varieties, and we grow one here called polyanthus stella champagne, which you can grow from seed in the summer and it will flower the following sort of winter into spring. And it's the most beautiful color, sort of peach, apricot, a little touch of plum through there. And they are all edible. We use them to scatter over cakes and puddings, but we also use them um, just uh, pulling the center of the flower off and just keeping the petals to again scatter over salad. So all the polyanthus family, so every single member of the primrose and polyanthus family, every single one are edible. So finding an early one is really handy. But, you know, you could just go to the garden centre and buy some polyanthus, a big tray, if you're having a party, and use the flowers of those. And because they're cut and come again, polyanthus, by harvesting one lot, another lot just grows back again. So, you know, it won't deplete them. For February, any of the viola family are edible. So literally any pansy or violet or viola and every single one are edible. And we find by February, we've certainly got the, the native one by sowing it in the autumn, viola heart seas, is flowering away. And that's the lovely one that's purple and yellow together. And then we also grow another one which brings a beautiful mahogany, rich brown into the flower color of the purple and the yellow called Antique Shades. And that's, that's really lovely. Tiger's Eye Red is another real favorite. But anyway, it simply doesn't matter. So again, you can either grow them from seed or you can go to the garden center or go online and order a tray or a few pots of any of the violas. And for February, right the way through until June, they'll give you plenty of edible flowers. And the point is every single one is edible. Then in March, the new one that I've really fallen in love with this year is the Crimson Flowered Broad Bean. And all broad bean flowers are edible, but of course, maybe you don't want to pick the flower because then you're not going to get the beans. Whereas the crimson flower broad bean is quite starchy when you eat it. And so I actually tend to grow it almost more just for the flower. And we actually grow this undercover in the greenhouse. And so we can start picking it earlier than we would out in the garden, which of course would be April and into May. But inside in the greenhouse, we can pick the crimson flower broad bean from March and it's got a delicious fragrance and also the apical where the where the flower buds are you can eat the whole section so you can scatter that over a salad or you can make a really wonderful primavera risotto with peas and broad beans and things and scatter it not cook it but just scatter it as you take it to the table so that's another really wonderful thing and that's for March now in April the world's your oyster. I mean, there are just so many things really starting to flower, like all the hardy annuals, the calendulas, etc. But without doubt, my favorite new discovery this year is that all tulips are edible. Can you believe that? Tulip flowers are edible. 
And we did a taste testing of, of lots of them here. And our favorite by far was White Valley. It used to be called Exotic Emperor. And it's the white uh, semi-double. So it's an early peony flowered variety or early double variety. Really perennial, really fantastically good tulip. But we tempered it individual petals and honestly they taste exactly like a runner bean so completely delicious lovely mixed and decorating over a salad but you know literally a whole flower in itself as long as you remove the stigma in the middle and the calyx behind would be a lovely thing so we've been experimenting quite a lot of those uh, quite a lot of the tulips but that seemed to be our particularly good and was certainly our favorite so then into may calendulas and borage you know i already mentioned the english marigolds for april because if you've sown your hardy annuals in the autumn they'll start to flower certainly by may but but often with calendulas earlier but all the calendula family are edible every single part of it and so are the borage family and i used to spend a lot of time in the veneto in italy about an hour outside venice in the foothills of the dolomites when i was a child my parents used to rent a house every other Easter. And there we would have really quite often uh, tempura edible flowers, but it wasn't called tempura there. It was called frito misto, of course, um, the Italian equivalent. But calendula and borage was really commonly used. So again, just the top section of the borage or the flower of the calendula. And they are really, really famous also, of course, for decorating drinks And so a classic ice cube. So I was talking about ice bowls earlier, but you can just get one of those uh, really brilliant silicon ice trays. Well, you can use any ice tray, but, and you just pop the flour in the base of each cell and fill it up with water and then pop it out. And you've got the most beautiful borage flour sitting in the middle of your ice cube or a calendula petal. With the calendulas, you do want to remove the petals away from the boss of the flour because it's a bit sort of almost too meaty, really. Then in June, courgettes are starting to flower quite prolifically. And you can pick the male flowers, which don't have the fruit behind, as well as the female flowers with a little fruit and a little courgette behind it. And the only thing you need to know about those is for um, both, just remove the stigma. I tend to leave a little bit of the stem on of the male flowers, so you've got something to dip it into and hold it with and I always tend to use those in tempura but you can stuff them as well and a really lovely recipe is just you make up a mix of some kind of cream cheese whether it be Philadelphia or whatever and put flavoring through it I love using pine nuts and thyme and a little bit of honey and that's really delicious Or you can use peas and mint mixed through the cream cheese, and that's really delicious too. And the key thing with that is not to try and force too much of the mix into the center of the flour, having removed the stigma. So you just want to use a a, a heat teaspoon, not a tablespoon, into the center, and then just twist the the flour of, of the courgette or squash. And it's almost like Velcro. It sort of sticks onto itself, and then you dip it into your batter and then shallow fry it or deep fry it. But um, courgettes are fabulous and really will be flowering prolifically from June. And then for July, I would move on to runner bean flowers. So I already mentioned, I mean, I do love runner beans if they're tiny. I don't like them when they get that sort of rather coarse, almost like toenail bit. That's a disgusting description, but it is like that. And also they get stringy. Um, Not keen on that. So do you know what? I, I actually pick the bean flowers almost more than I pick the beans because they're so prolific. They'll only just produce more and more and more because they're classically cut and come again. And so we actually grow three or four different colors here of runner beans uh, mixed on a sort of arcade of them so that we can pick the flowers. And so we grow a red called pole star and then a coral colored one. I think it's called sunshine and aurora is another one in that color, sort of corally pink. And then a pink and white, which is called Painted Lady, and white called White Lady. And they're all delicious, but they look wonderful as a tempura or scattered over salad or scattered over a rice salad. And and just pick to your heart's content and there will only be more. And then for August, I thought definitely my favorite I need to mention is nasturtium. 
I just adore nasturtiums. Um, they famously love very poor ground. So if you've got rich soil like we have here, we tend to actually add grit into their planting situation or we sow them kind of, I don't know, like on the edge of the car park or something because they really don't need fertility and they actually flower better without. And when you're picking, just be a little bit careful that you check for any of either the little black beetle which is a flea beetle, which likes brassicas, which of course nasturtiums are in the brassica family. And just check, not the flowers so much, but the leaves if you're going to pick them too for cabbage white, eggs and caterpillars. Yuck. But anyway, you can always wash them off, no problem, or just sort of wipe them off. September, it's dahlia time and you can't go wrong with dahlias. Every single part of the dahlia plant is edible. I remember I made two great friends about 15 years ago when Jonathan and I, Jonathan Buckley, who's the photographer I work with, and I were asked to a dahlia festival in Holland. And I met Dickie Skipper and Kreen von Boxtel, who've remained firm friends ever since, because they invited me to a garden where literally everything we ate was dahlias. And it was called De Boskova, but that's my Dutch accent is not very good. And so anyone who lives in the Netherlands will now be laughing. But anyway, you can eat the tubers. I have tried them, wasn't particularly keen. The thing we eat here all the time or scatter all the time here are, are the petals over salads and over puddings. But they make these beautiful just sort of threads of colour. And as I say, every single part of the dahlia, but particularly the flower petals are absolutely wonderful. So September is the high point for them. And then in October, of course, every part of every salvia is edible. And salvias famously go on flowering right through until the late autumn, almost until Christmas here. And so whether it's the little annual one like salvia viridis blue, the flowers of that are edible, or the very fragrant, uh, more pineapple one like pineapple sage or salvia nachtlinde, which means night butterfly, which we grow lots of here to protect our roses against uh, mildew and black spot. But anyway, doesn't matter. Salvia amistad, they're all edible. And so you can scatter them. And then November going back to Japan actually as inspiration and every chrysanthemum is edible and actually in Japan they're used quite a lot as a flavoring and they I remember going to a food festival in Regent's Park about 20 years ago and being given chrysanthemum jelly to taste and it's got a really unusual unique flavor I wasn't absolutely convinced but I, I think it would have grown on me but that's a delicacy in Japan but I use them here the whole time just like I use daily petals so dismembered and then scattered and the crazier the color and the shape so like the real spider croissants and um, they look absolutely fabulous and you can use them in tempura too so then getting right to the end of the year there are lots of things that are still just about going but particularly if you can bring them under cover I find pelagoniums are the thing that I turn to most in December. I use attar of roses, perhaps most of all, but literally any of the late flowering pelagoniums, particularly the scented leaf varieties. So sweet mimosa, pink capricorn or pink caprifolium, attar of roses, any of those are really fabulous. And of course, their leaves are edible, but it's the flowers that we're talking about here. So I would scatter them over a cake or over an ice cream or over a pudding. And they look and taste really wonderful. And particularly as our roses, which is used very widely in the perfume industry to give that incredible rose geranium perfume. So quite a few ideas there. Me rabbiting away. So edible flowers, as you might be able to tell, are something that I've been passionate about and experimented with for many years here and actually there's a whole chapter in my year round veg book which just came out this spring about edible flowers so lots more in there with lots of photos but that gives you a really good idea of things that you can grow to eat that are really pretty too Thanks so much for listening to Grow Cookie to Range and hearing me wittering on on my own about edible flowers. Next week, because it's getting into holiday time, I'm joined by Josie Lewis, our head gardener here, and we're going to discuss and, and try and give you as many tips as we can to keep your pots and garden as healthy when you get back from holiday, even if it's a drought. Well, as healthy as it was when you went away. So see you then. You can 
find more information, photos and advice sheets on all the plants and recipes we talk about on this podcast by heading to the show notes or at sarahraven.com forward slash podcast.